Don't you just hate it when you've got your pencil sharpened, your calculator polished, new batteries inserted and a pile of paper on the desk, rearing to apply that beautiful Pythagorean theorem to obtain the length of that pesky hypotenuse once and for all. But then you realize, hey, that's not a right angle triangle. Is your day ruined now? Will you have to leave your gear and find something social to do? Don't fear. After watching this video, there will be no need to neatly pack your gear into that pristinely organized case just yet. The cosine rule will save the day. If you'd like to thank the cosine rule, I'm sure it would appreciate any likes for this video and subscriptions to this channel. Hello and welcome to the main course, dish up some food for thought. I recommend that you already know how to apply the theory of Pythagoras before continuing with the cosine rule we're discussing today. Follow the link in the top right or in the description below if you need to brush up on Pythagoras first. According to his theory, we can calculate the length of the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle by using the length of the other two sides, using the formula c squared equals a squared plus b squared. We are graphically showing the classic example of 3 squared plus 4 squared being 25, which gives us a length of 5 for the hypotenuse. But what do we do when the triangle is not right angled? When the previous right angle increases to larger than 90 degrees, the side that was previously the hypotenuse gets longer. And when the angle decreases, the side shortens. But how can we tell by how much? Let's look at some special cases to nudge us in the direction of the formula. If we increase the angle all the way to 180 degrees, the triangle becomes a straight line, with the side we're after equaling the sum of the other two sides. This is the longest we can make this side. In this example, the length becomes 4 plus 3 equals 7. But let's keep considering the areas or squares. 7 squared equals 49, but we can also write 7 squared as 4 plus 3 squared. When we now fit the squares of the other two sides into this larger square, we see that there are two other factors, one being 3 times 4 and the other 4 times 3, needed to complete the 49 unit square. They are of the same area, so we could write the 49 area as 4 squared plus 3 squared plus twice 3 times 4. In general terms, you get c squared equal to a squared plus b squared plus 2 times a times b. Note how our graphical area shows us exactly why the expansion of the a plus b squared term makes sense. Compare this formula to the Pythagorean formula. The a squared plus b squared terms are there in both cases. But the 180 degree version has an extra 2ab term. In our example, 2ab equals 24. And we add 24 to our Pythagorean answer of 25 for the area to get to 49. Remember that and let's look at our second special case, when the angle decreases all the way to 0 degrees. This is the shortest we can make the previous hypotenuse. It's clear from the model that the length of the side is now 4 minus 3, or 1, and that the area is 4 minus 3 squared, which is just one little square unit. The trick is to now realize that the area of 25 in the Pythagorean case had to be decreased by 24 to get to 1. This is the same number that was added in the 180 degree case. For side lengths in general, we have c squared equal to a minus b squared, which can be expanded as a squared plus b squared, this time minus 2 times a times b. Comparing the three cases for the angle equaling 180, 90 and 0 degrees, we see that we can standardize the formulas into a single formula as follows. c squared equals a squared plus b squared plus 2ab multiplied by some function of the angle, which we need to figure out. We're looking for functions that have the values of minus 1, 0 and 1 at the different angles. And whenever you have circle rotations, you can bet on the unit circle becoming involved. Let's look at the locations of these three special cases on the unit circle. Our 0, 90 and 180 degree cases lie on the x equals 1, y equals 1 and x equals minus 1 axes. For the 0 degree case, we need a function that returns minus 1. Now, the cosine function is defined as x over r. For the 0 degree angle, x and r coincide. They're equal in length, so x over r equals 1. But we need minus 1, so we take minus cosine. 
and we get the minus 1 that we need. Let's check it for the 90 degree case. Now x equals 0 since we're at y equals 1 but we've moved all the way back to 0 on the x axis. So x over r equals 0 and minus cosine still gives 0 as we require. And finally let's check for the 180 degree case. We now move all the way left to x equals minus 1 and x over r becomes minus 1. Taking minus cosine gives us 1 as we require. So the function minus cosine of the angle provides us with solutions for our three special cases. If we replace our previously unknown function with minus cosine, we get the formula for the cosine rule. Note that we have not proven the formula yet, we've merely shown that this formula works for our three special cases. The aim was to understand the formula visually. But any function that goes through those three points on the cosine graph would also pass the test up to now. In order to actually prove the equation for all cases, we need some trigonometric gymnastics. But it's really not that difficult. We need only the Pythagorean theorem and the simple definition of the cosine function. Let's quickly go through the thought process. Try to focus on the reasoning for each step before you focus on the formulas. We want to calculate the length of the unknown side of a triangle that is not right angled. We do know how to calculate the hypotenuse of a right angled triangle though. So, we could try to obtain a right angled triangle somehow. Actually, if we draw a line with unknown length h from the one corner to the opposite side and perpendicular to the side, we find that we can construct two right angled triangles from the original triangle by splitting the side a with known length into two parts of unknown length x and a minus x. It seems like we're making things worse by bringing in more unknowns, but what we're actually doing is splitting a large problem that we cannot solve into two smaller problems for which we do have a solution. And if we can solve the two small problems, the large one is also solved. Let's start with a triangle on the left. We apply the normal Pythagorean theorem to it to see that the unknown x squared plus h squared equals the known b squared. So we have one equation or one piece of information for trying to solve x and h. Since there are two unknowns, we need two pieces of information. Recall that the definition of the cosine function in angle theta is quite simply x over the radius, or in this case x over b. We can rearrange and write the unknown x equals the known b cosine theta. So now we have two pieces of information. We now apply the Pythagorean theorem to the other triangle as well to get c squared equals a minus x squared plus h squared. Note that since we have cut side b out of this triangle, the two smaller problems x and h are now part of the larger problem in the place of the original known value and we need to express them back in terms of the original known length b. When we expand the bracket term, we get a squared minus 2ax plus x squared. We can use our one piece of information to replace x squared plus h squared with b squared. Now there's only one x left and we replace it with the second piece of information to get c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine theta, which is the cosine rule. So we are now able to obtain the length of the third side of a triangle when we have the lengths of the other two sides and the angle between those two sides. And we don't need that angle to be 90 degrees as in the Pythagorean theorem's case anymore. Aren't you glad you didn't go and do something social earlier? Mm -hmm.